Alors, j'espère que vous êtes repus et prêts pour cet après-midi euh, de contenu euh, vraiment euh, très informatif, en commençant par cette euh, conférence sur le blockchain. Vous avez sûrement, si vous n'êtes pas sûr de ce que c'est, vous êtes au bon endroit. C'est de ça qu'on va parler. Mais vous en avez sûrement déjà entendu parler. Euh, J'arrive moi-même, il y a une conférence South by Southwest là, qui a été mentionnée tout à l'heure. J'en arrive moi également. Et je peux vous assurer euh, que la technologie du blockchain est sur toutes les lèvres également euh, dans ce type de, euh, de conférence-là. Donc, euh, c'est une technologie quand même relativement... Euh, complexe à expliquer. C'est pour ça qu'on fait appel à ces messieurs pour le faire. Euh, et surtout, on va voir de quelle manière cette technologie-là peut être appliquée au milieu de la musique. C'est bien évidemment ce qui nous intéresse aujourd'hui. Alors, je vous les présente. Nos deux intervenants aujourd'hui sont Benji Rogers de Dot Blockchain Music, donc un entrepreneur euh, basé à New York, un musicien également, et qui est cofondateur de ce projet Dot Blockchain Music. Euh, il vise Hein, il n'est pas très ambitieux. Il a un tout petit objectif dans la vie, celle de, celui de révolutionner la commercialisation et la promotion de la musique dans une économie numérique. Donc, euh, ben, on lui souhaite bonne chance et on a surtout hâte de savoir comment il va faire. Et Joe Conyers euh, III, hein? c'est ça, III, voilà, le, le troisième, donc, on peut présumer qu'il y en a deux autres, et euh, qui, qui est vice-président, directeur général de Song Trust et euh, également vice-président de Technology for Downtown Music Publishing. Alors, avec lui, on va euh, parler également de licence, de euh, gestion de produits, euh, d'autres types de ce euh, genre d'initiatives, encore là, toujours appli appliquées à cette technologie du blockchain. Donc, sans plus attendre, voici Benji Rogers et Joe Conyers III. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Um, je parle un peu de français, but that's about it. <laughs> so, um, thank you for having me. Um, I start all of my presentations, and I hope this translates into French, but in the race to adopt new technologies, the music industry historically has finished just ahead of the Amish. <laughs> and the reason I think that that's so interesting is, is it's unfair to the Amish. Um, <laughs> Uh, because one of the Amish principles is to build things that last, that will be around for a long, long time. And when I first started to present blockchain, um, I'm in my first conversations with Joe, who really informed the publisher side of what we're doing, and which is why I'm so thrilled that he's a partner in the project with us, is, um, is that I think that we're all turning towards something that can last, which is also an amazing attribute of blockchains. Mm -hmm kind of the point of a blockchain is it's supposed to be something that will be there forever. The larger it gets, the stronger it gets. So I was asked, um, uh, and I've prepared by another amazing gentleman named Lee Lefevre, um, a small blockchain video for those, to kind of it's a real simple blockchain explainer. Then I'll discuss the dot blockchain project as, as we see it. Um, and then we'd love to, basically Joe and I would love to answer your questions afterwards. So um, without um, further ado, This is the, the blockchain. For most physical things, ownership is obvious. When someone gives you a camera, it becomes yours. But ownership of other things may not be so easy to manage. Think about owning land, for instance. You could own a plot of land fair and square, but your ownership isn't obvious. Someone could come along and try to build a house on it without knowing it's yours. In the real world, authorities like banks and governments account for ownership and help prevent these kinds of problems. But this can be a risk too. Think about it this way. Imagine a small village with eight plots of land. When property is bought or sold, the village government accounts for who owns what. This worked for years, but then something terrible happened. Lightning struck the government building and burned it to the ground along with all the records. Suddenly, Ownership of property was unclear, and villagers could claim to own property they didn't. It was chaos. Today, our system is similar. A central authority like a company, bank, or government accounts for ownership. They help us establish and protect what we own, and account for it when ownership changes. While this system has worked for years, the Internet has enabled a completely new way to think about ownership called blockchain. 
To understand it, let's consider our village again. When the government building burned down, the villagers saw another opportunity. Instead of having a central authority manage ownership, what if they all managed ownership together in a decentralized system? Once they figured out who owned what, they created a list with everyone's name and the property they owned. This list was the heart of the system and was shared with everyone in the village who each kept their own copy secure. When ownership needed to change in the village, the villagers could verify ownership and approve the transaction by confirming that the seller owned the property. Once the transaction occurred, everyone's list updated automatically. Over time, a record of all these transactions were organized and sealed into blocks that were all linked together and represented a complete and public history that couldn't be changed. This was the village's blockchain. Using this method, ownership was obvious and transparent to everyone. The villagers didn't need a central authority and didn't have the risk of records disappearing or being manipulated. This is the basic idea of blockchain, which many people know through the digital currency Bitcoin. In the online world, it means that a huge network of independent computers all keep an identical list or ledger of who owns what. When ownership changes, whether it's currency, land, or intellectual property, the lists are all updated simultaneously with each new transaction. Like the village, these transactions are organized into a chain of blocks that provide a way to verify ownership today and for every transaction in the past. Blockchain is very complicated and still developing, but could become a fundamentally new way to manage and account for changes in ownership. Like our villagers, we could see whole systems move to using a form of this idea in the future. Cool. So it's a very simple, um, it's a very large com concept, but it's also actually quite simple. And I was asked also to kind of give this in the context of the wider industries that we deal with. Blockchain is largely a fintech play at the moment. Financial services are the ones that are really taking advantage of it. But to put the investment capital into it, um, there was $1.4 billion invested into blockchain, blockchain startups in the last nine months of 2016. The blockchain carried about a month ago a $22 billion market cap, and that was doing 200,000 transactions a day. So this is before it's even hit size and scale on one blockchain. I want to just dispel a couple of myths. Just because it's a blockchain, it doesn't mean everything is exposed and public. There are two types of blockchain, permissionless, which means everything is viewable, and permissioned, which means it's closed. So those are important because what happened was a bunch of blockchain enthusiasts looking about 18 or 19 years old came in and told the music industry, hey, we can solve all your problems with a blockchain. And the music industry looked at them and said, interesting, can you really? So part of what we tried to do was kind of come up with a method for how you could bring the music, music industry into a decentralized or blockchain-based world. And this presentation is designed to kind of show a, a, a journey, so forgive me if it's a little simplistic, but there's a, a method to the madness. And please, there'll be questions, time for questions as well. So what we're really working on here is what I call digital rights expression. And I want you to imagine a world, and this is a nice world, in which a song leaves the studio with the information on who wrote and recorded it hard-coded into the music file itself. And a world in which ownership data is required in order to make the song actually work. So that's the premise that we're going for here, okay? And that I call digital rights expression because as you all well know, there's two sides to every song. A song has both a writer or writers and a performer or artist. Now, 90% of the technology world don't know that. So when they come in and say, my blockchain will save you, they're completely unaware that there are actually two sides to a song and there can be hundreds of publishers and sub-publishers and all kinds of mess in there. But we think there's a chance. But what has changed is where we used to own the format, now songs are files and files go everywhere. So the uh, back in my day when I was recording, I would get hammered and send, send rough mixes to all my friends and they would end up in all kinds of strange places because they're files and it doesn't matter. And, they're... So, and then I view that system that we have today as a house really built on sand because every time song files are copied, their data can be altered or removed completely. 
So there's two sides to this problem. A, the songs have two pieces. B, the song files go everywhere. And lastly, those files are completely rewritable in every way, shape, or form. That's kind of crazy. It's not, we haven't created a, a digital asset. We've created a map to where one could lie, but there are millions of them created all the time. So, uh, to add to this problem, there is no place, public or private, to look up and to verify ownership. And what I mean is there are many places, but there's no one. And that's a challenge. One of the th concepts that have really s people have stumbled with on blockchain is, well, how do you get to the truth? Who actually owns it? And I'm going to get to that shortly. There's a method and a madness. Um, why? Because stakeholders in the music industry today, who I roughly define as artists, labels, publishers, trade organizations, digital service providers, managers, and PROs, do not share their data. This is a very strange concept, right? We have all this common data, but we don't share it. And what that means is, oh, and to and add to that, or use a common file format. So when, a, when our music, our work, our digital gold is expressed outwards, we do so in WAV files, AIFF files, MP3 files, stem track files, ACC files, all kinds of dot some things, but there's no common one. So we're trying to match codes to non formatted files that can be rewritten anyway. So it's a big challenge, but an interesting one. So what we proposed with dot blockchain is what we're calling a music industry owned format. So no more your song name dot MP3, your song name dot wave. We're proposing a your song name dot BC. And what goes inside of it for a basic registration. Now, you guys are publishers, so you'll know that this is going to be, seem radically simplistic, but that's on purpose, OK? So for basic registration, we propose what we call minimum viable data. And what I mean by that is that when you're exporting a song from a workstation, if anyone who's creating a work or you want to get one of your old songs into this new format, you would have to publish at least one writer or publisher with contact and payment information. This is to a private layer, right? The payment information is a private layer. The public side just shows this is the publisher. At least one artist performer, contact and payment information, the song name, and a copy of the song. Where is the song? Because what occurred to me, so, and that's just for registration. Additional layers will be needed for distribution. Because what occurred to me was, if I can find out one person, one of the writers, and I can find out the performer, I can find out the song name, and reference what it actually sounds like, I can map that. I can map to those coordinates. If I don't know one, I can't do it. So if I'm on Spotify or, you, or um, Apple, it's got the song name, the artist, and the record label. Where's the other 50%? Where's the other bit that we need to have to commit commerce with that song? Let's assume for the purpose of this talk that the purpose is to commit commerce with songs, right? With, with what you own. So then enter the blockchain. So as we've said before, today's music industry is many centralized databases. From our research and with Joe's help, we've identified basically 180 kind of more formal, but 5,000 informal, oops, um, with little to no interoperability. Now, there are definitely efforts afoot to make interoperability happen, which is great. But I feel that all interoperability efforts are going to fall short if you actually can't reference them back to the sound recordings in which they are held. So that's kind of the concept here. But if we went to a blockchain and we use a decentralized and distributed network, then each node or each party to the system um, is going to create identical information. So basically a shared ledger. So if ownership in the song changes, everywhere that song is, ownership changes. And that's an immensely powerful concept. And decentralization is a powerful thing. The internet is decentralized. It's 27 supercomputers all over the world. And you can take a bunch of them down, but the others will still stand. It'll slow things down a little bit. You know, Amazon can slow things down, so there's another thing. So the new format plus the blockchain is kind of awesome. Because you can take your uh, a .bc file, right, is a new type of zip container format created, owned, and maintained by the music industry. This is the key. This is a music industry standard. We need publishers, labels, PROs, trade organizations to all agree as to what this is and how it will work. We're, a, we're, a, a, we're creating a layer underneath. We're not creating the end result. We're creating the, the, the interoperability layer. And the cool part is that no .bc can be created without that minimum viable data and a copy of the song. 
and that's absolutely on purpose. We looked at can we get to DDEX registration and CWR straight away, and that's possible in the future, I think, but for now, we had to find a way to get just the minimum piece in to map to everything else. And one cool thing about um, blockchains is when you create an entry into a blockchain, it creates a unique string of letters and numbers. It's a blockchain ID. And you can never insert the same one twice. So if you start to map these existing industry locators like ISRC, ISWC, IPI, ISNI to that unique string, every piece of the system, every piece of the change log exists for all to see, audit, and look at. Again, the permissioned layer is the private stuff, the public layer is the public stuff. So ideally speaking, when you go to Spotify, you click a button and it will show you the label, publisher of note, writers, etc., all viewable. So speaking the same language, each .bc music bundle created writes itself and any changes made permanently to the blockchain. So you cannot delete anything from a blockchain. You can append forward but never backwards. And that enables all of the music industry to speak the same language. So in a blockchain-based world, what we would look at is all data managed, replicated, and synced. So again, our parties here all speaking the same language through interoperable plugins. So this is how everyone could speak together. And with the common format, that means that wherever you find old MP3s, old waves that have inconsistent format, you get to ask the question, why is my publishing information not in that song? Dear Platform X, why do you want old music files that do not contain my rights and information? That's what we have to get this conversation kind of swung towards. So I believe that, that this is kind of the map of what it will look like. And as far as interoperability, I believe that music separated from its .bc container would become unplayable on modern devices and compliant digital services. That's the goal. We won't get there straight away, but ultimately, I want every publisher and every label and every songwriter and every artist to say, why do you not want my rights in the music itself? Why? I would love for them to come and answer that question as to why it, you know. So anyway, but then we've got the problem of truth. So how do you get to truth? And Tim Berners-Lee, many years ago, suggested what he called the semantic web, which is basically people will make claims about stuff on the internet, but how do you do it? So I believe that you have to follow basically the model of Facebook, which is approve, ignore, and deny. In .bc world, we call this tagging. What I mean by that is, this is a picture that I took of us winning a competition in, in London last year. And so you can see, I, I entered some metadata on the photograph. I created an asset, put some metadata into it. And I basically decided to tag Bill Wilson, who's one of our co-founders, and Ken Umazaki. And what that did was, it altered my asset from that with richer metadata. So Facebook, in this case, has a change log seeing the differences. But what that also means is when Bill and Alan and Ken approve the tag, that equals the truth. If they were to ignore the tag, that equals the truth. And if they wanted to dispute the tag, that's how we would get to the newest version of the truth. So as far as the creation process and how it relates to music, it would be very similar to that. So you would say, what type of new entry? Existing composition and recording or a new composition and recording? And then you would go to tagging. So in a similar way, we took Suede, for example. And as you can see on the left, you've got what we call verifying organizations. And what those verifying organizations are are basically places that you would start to tag your work. Now, this will be done with bulk actions and a whole bunch of other stuff. So this is, I'm showing you the raw, what one person would do if they were doing this right now. But essentially, you'd look up Downtown Music Publishing, which is Joe. You'd look up um, Columbia Records, which is not Joe, thank goodness. Sorry. <laughs> I hope we're not required. I love you, Columbia. Um, uh, and what you end up with is building to the truth. So if that was the previous one, so you can see all the people involved in the track and work itself, then it becomes a verifying organization of the label, the publisher, the PRO, a contact for licensing. So in case I want to commit commerce with this, who do I contact to do so? You would have Spotify, because in this architecture, you can tag your work in Spotify. You can transmit the information to them so they can sit there and say, the publishers and verifying organizations all add up to this trust score 
that equals something we can work with. And you've got Twitter and you've got Facebook. The reason for those is you have to prove who you are and then your relationship to the works. So we've got a method for doing that using this verifying organization structure. And then the, uh, if you want to look at a works view, so let's say, for example, that you're SOCAN, who are one of the partners in the project as well, you would basically have a viability threshold in each work. So you'd sit there and say, this one animal, ni animal nitrate has a 100% representation. It's got label, it's got PRO, it's got other um, verifi verifications. And so therefore, when you pop in, you basically get to look at that same view. This is about mapping. We call it basically um, uh, uh, the graph of claims, where you're making claims about a work that are verified by organizations such as SOCAN, ASCAP, PRS, etc., and then labels and publishers all the way down to the songwriters themselves. So it's a big process, but we think that it's um, eminently doable. And the largest example of this, of course, would be Facebook, which has 1.65 billion people on it. Um, so it's a self-healing system. Bless you. Um, that's OK. Um, basically, user and song level authority. This enables an artist or publisher or label or PRO or songwriter to express their rights digitally into something with permanence, right? Amendment forward, never backwards. It creates an immutable change log. Everything that happens to the song is there for those who are permission to see the private stuff and those the public stuff. So if it changes, Spotify is not going to pay the wrong person for very long. Literally, the second a change occurs and it's verified across the network, that's who Spotify or YouTube or SoundCloud, whoever it is, pays. Nested permissions. Can I just add one thing yeah. there? And there'll be a record that someone else was paid for some period of time. Correct. That you can't delete. Yep. Which means so, no more having to audit people because you'll just know where the money went. Yep. Nested permissions. This means that anything other than the minimum viable data is optional. What I mean by that is, is that you can put in a ton of rich information that you may want to keep private between yourself, your, publish your fellow publishers, your PRO. That's not public data. and doesn't need to be. We believe in facilitating business rules between parties. Um, conflicts are solved and then broadcast to the entire network, incentivizing better data. If I start putting in a bunch of crappy data, I'm not going to meet the viability threshold and no one wants to work with me. If I, if you, so you incentivize good behavior. A decentralized repository for global digital works. And it's an, basically an efficient P2P mechanism for allowing everyone to be on the same page. And then bad actors reveal who they are to everyone who runs the system. The other thing I mentioned is, is that there are really strong existing standards. The way we get to them are kind of archaic. So, this is what the actual architecture looks like. And as you can see, in our partnership curve, what we view is, is that from aggregator label and DSP, that's DDEX. So the goal is to get your .bc in the center with the metadata around it on the blockchain and the cloud all to equal DDEX, and then down here, CWR. So the goal is to basically have everyone's cloud around the outside talk to each other via the blockchain with the metadata layer feeding the file format itself. And this file format is living because it will change, and that's the point of it. So it's, it's a very um, powerful analogies you've got with Google Docs or with Microsoft Word. So this is known technology. We're just applying it to a blockchain-based ecosystem to create truth and digital expression. So I believe that we're looking at basically digital gold versus digital plastic, and that digital permanence creates digital scarcity which I think is a good thing, which enables permission and obligation. So what that means is that I can put, I can give someone permission to work with my song, and inherent in that permission is the obligation. So I can say, this is my work, this is how I want it to be treated, I give you permission to use it at these rules, and there is an obligation to that. And I believe that the publishers should have equal say in the recording as the labels, and that, that's meaningful. But we have to get it into the same box or else we can't do it. Um, and that basically for every song. So what we've created essentially is a fairly tradable music format because the first .bc file created has built and now adds to a global decentralized database of music rights every time a song is created. So then, how hard is this and how do we do it? So who does this hurt, first of all? It hurts those who profit from a lack of transparency, piracy, or the slowing down of payments to rights holders. So there we go. So why would they do it? Because for the first time in history, there is more money to be made over the table than there is under it. We are leaving 
billions and billions and billions of dollars on the table every year because people want to commit commerce with the works that we create and own and they can't do it. It's just simply too difficult to do. So it's easier to break the law. But what's happening is, is if you're holding on to 10 bucks here, you're losing a thousand above. And I think that that's really what the opportunity is. There's a way for everyone to get involved. Um, these are our first partners. So we've got sponsor development partners in CD Baby, Fuga, MediaNet, SoCan, and SongTrust. Um, we have a, a, a partnership queue of 126 companies, about 26 of them also wanting to kind of you know, get in here. We're um, doing phase two of the technology. We're an open source public benefit corporation, which is, as, <laughs> which is tough to raise money for, I'll tell you that. But, but the point being that this is something that the music industry has to adopt and facilitate. This is not for one venture-backed company, which we're not, to come in and say, use our blockchain, use our this. Um, and yeah, so I think we should take questions and dig into Joe's brain because he's way smarter than me. So .blockchainmusic.com, uh, and then if you want to look at GitHub, we've got version one of the uh, software, which is truly rudimentary, uh, ready to go. Thank you. So maybe we can take questions once we're, we're, we're done, right? Yeah, I, I, there's a couple of questions I want to ask the audience, actually. Okay, go ahead. Could I see a, a show of hands? Who here is a publisher? Okay, about half. Who here is a label? <laughs> label publisher. Um, who else do we have? Do we have any artists in the audience? Some artists? Some who did artists? I offend? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Students. <laughs> That's uh, not fair. <laughs> Um, entrepreneurs, cool, all right. Technology people, developers, okay, okay, good. All right, that gives me a better idea of the audience here. Um, so, you know, we've been working with Benji for, you know, talking about this idea for years now. Yeah. Um, blockchain is not a new concept. It's been around, what, six, seven years now? Eight, Eight years? Eight years. Um, but it's the equivalent of like 1995 internet. You know, we had the internet in arguably the 50s. It took years to get to the point to where it was useful. <laughs> and it, you know, you think about the 80s. We had these things called BBS, where you could dial into your, you know, a, a bulletin board system, and you'd use this little modem, and you'd see little lines. We're basically a little bit ahead of that in terms of blockchain era. It's a lot of command line historically, and now it's moving into more web-based interfaces, applications that you'll see on your, your, you know, your phone or on your, your desktop. desktop. Um, we're getting in that era where we're going to have clients for the blockchain, which when Benji says plugins, that's what he's really talking about. You're going to have lots of different ways in. I foresee you know, publishers, for example, eventually wanting to change their internal software to interact with something like this. It will be our internal database or one of our databases where we'll keep some of the information there up to date and that will probably keep us up to date internally as well as we'll add layers of our own personal and confidential information around that, whether that be contracts information, um, my agreements with my writers, so on and so forth. Um, so it's not necessarily you're going to put everything on your business into this thing. You're just going to put the things that make the most sense because typically they are shared between your commercial partners, whether that be your co-publishers, co-writers, um, other artists in your band, your manager, your, you know, what have you. Um, so I think there's a lot of misconception around this stuff. So if anyone has, is not sure on anything, I really do want to open the floor to those kind of questions specifically. Yeah. Alors, est-ce qu'il y aurait des questions Oui, mais peut-être qu'il y a euh, un micro qui peut se balader parce que ça va nous permettre d'enregistrer le son également avec vos questions. Il y a déjà, euh, oui, déjà une file. Alors, s'il y a des questions à l'avant, peut-être se diriger vers l'arrière parce que je sens qu'on se bouscule. Ah, mais c'est formidable. Hein? On a suscité des questions. Je pense qu'avant de passer euh, aux questions, on peut remercier euh, ces deux messieurs d'ouvrir une toute nouvelle <laughs> fenêtre dans notre esprit. Thank you so much for, for that presentation. That was very, very interesting, I think. Cool. Uh, we saw little bits of the future today. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Alors maintenant, première question, uh, allez-y. Vous nommer, s'il vous plaît. Oui, Jean-Robert Bizaillon. Hi. Uh, one element you didn't touch, uh, I think is very important within the blockchain concept, is the notion of uh, smart contracts. Yep. Could you speak about this a little bit, please? Sure. So, um, 
Uh, there's a reason I didn't speak about two things in that presentation. The first is smart contracts, and the second is uh, uh, payments. Um, as, or as we refer to it lovingly, uh, Chris, our CTO, refers to it lovingly as value propagation. Um, so uh, one of the amazing things about blockchains is you can create essentially um, uh, uh, behaviors on top of your works. Um, smart contracts uh, are, are, are kind of a misnomer for, for they're, they're just contracts. They're saying once this happens, this happens. Um, but what's interesting about a blockchain-based world is because you, have, you can have them self-execute against each other. So essentially what we can do is create rules on top of our music. And I kind of hinted to that. One example would be this music is available in these territories for this price. If you want to pay me, the second payment happens. You have it for this many plays, spins. If it goes on YouTube, it has to have this type of ad. You can build basically rule sets on top of your works, including if you chose to, to say, my song can never be used at a Donald Trump rally or in a Donald Trump ad advert if you wanted. Now, whether that's honored today is one thing, but that's entirely possible in a blockchain-based world. And so what you'll read about when you Google blockchain is a whole bunch of smart contracts that have gone wrong. Because again, machines just don't, they don't think in the same way that we do. So you know, anyone who's ever negotiated a contract will know that there's five ways I can kill you and five ways you can kill me. And our mutually assured destruction should take care of you know, the honor part, right? Computers may not understand that. So part of what we, what we get to is, is, and to simplify it in the way I see it, if you own a catalog or a, or a bunch of songs, you will be able to create rules around them that machines will read. And if machines can read them, they can commit commerce with you directly. The second reason we didn't hit payments, and I'll tell you why, is because currently, a bunch of the blockchain companies out there, and there are many, Ethereum is one big one, Bitcoin blockchain is one big one, IBM, big media chain, a bunch of others. Uh, Intel's got one called Sawtooth Lake. They love cool names, Fabric, Sawtooth Lake, that kind of thing. Um, I haven't seen a blockchain that can handle the size and scale of anything like the payments that the music industry has to process. And this was a big mistake, I believe, that a lot of the early blockchain companies made, is they come in and said, we can do all your transactions for you, and we can pay micropayments in real time. Now, the theory is true, if you could get to that transaction volume. But again, the Bitcoin blockchain, the largest implementation of a blockchain anywhere on earth, is 200,000 transactions a day. Roughly, and it gets jammed up at six transactions per second. So if the PRS was tracking three trillion streams last year, how do you do it? So a, a lot of this was, you know, a lot of technologists, in particular some of the blockchain, uh, you, know, you know, evangelists, and they are evangelists, came in and said, everything you're doing is wrong, we can rebuild it from scratch, just start again, and we can do micropayments in real time. And what I've spent a lot of this last year explaining to a lot of these tech companies is, the people in this industry are not stupid, right? So they know when you're selling bullshit, they know that. And don't do it, because you're harming the, the larger cause, which is that blockchains will be a safer way to commit commerce. So our methodology here has been, number one, let's solve registration. Let's get the publishing and performance information into the same unit. Let's create a truly tradable smart asset. Because at the moment, we don't have that. I have to go to five different places to figure out who owns something. And even then, it's still unsure. So I think that the, the way we approach this is, is you've got, first of all, registration. Then once we've got these digitally tradable assets, we can create rules, smart contracts on top of them, and then we can propagate value on top of them there. So we've gone that method because our, our thinking is the existing ways of paying in the music industry are fine and work. Could they be better? Absolutely, everything could be better. You know, it still takes me three days to transfer something to my bank. I have no concept of why that's true. It's a crime, but there it is. I can send Joe some, some Bitcoin and it will arrive in seconds from, you know, a centralized network of like 21,000 computers all over the world just chomping on these things. So that's the reason that we didn't approach those two, because registration leads to smart contracts, leads to value propagation. I think, and smart contracts are going to take a lot of experimentation before they get to prime time. It's going to take very simple smart contracts working in production environments for years till we start building more complex systems where we're doing, you know, sophisticated licensing, blanket licensing at scale. 
Um, it's hard enough just to do an escrow transaction using smart contracts that actually protects both sides fully um, and is better than the existing solution, which is, you know, probably depending on what kind of transaction could be upwards of a 1% fee, say if you're buying a house today. Um, reducing those fees and finding where there's incentive to create these smart contracts that actually help our businesses is where there will be interest in commerce, but I think that's a bit far off. The registration is our existing massive, massive conundrum of our space, and so much waste is there long before the smart contracts layer. I think we can probably get you know somewhere between 10 to 20, 30 percent efficiency back at almost every publisher, just given our, I mean, my internal workflow of sending songs to all these societies around the world, dealing with counterclaims, dealing with conflicts and dealing just with the uh, lack of commerce that happens while all those songs are in conflict. And, and I'll just say, I got an email earlier on today, and I'm not joking, just, I was sitting over there, and this VR company wants to license like a thousand songs. And I keep saying to them, it's gonna take you a couple of years. Like this cannot happen quickly, and they just don't understand it. They're like, do these people not want the money? And I'm like, well, they do. They just got to, you know, someone's got to write a letter and someone's got to send a fax and like, like, and they just go, stop it. It doesn't work. I don't have that much time. I built the thing in three months. And, and here's another thing I'll say. And I, I say, you know, I do that quote about the music industry and technology, but my stepfather was a publisher and I've spent, I've been a songwriter myself and I've performed myself and I've done every inch of this industry. I've been a manager, a label, a pub, all of them. Um, and I can tell you which one I regret the most. But, um, when I look at... We uh, want to know. Yes. <laughs> Another time. I was at South by Southwest, and I was judging the hackathon. And MediaNet and SoCan, uh, MediaNet was part of the hackathon. And I watched a 22-year-old girl build an instrument onto a plastic cube that you could play via a phone in augmented reality in 24 hours. Right? And so if you were to say to her, if she, let's say that, that, that instead of being an instrument, it was a jukebox. And, if, and so she's like, so all I need now is like, you know, 40 million songs and I can create this really cool augmented reality jukebox. And you say, that sounds great. So raise five million dollars, give two and a half million of it to the major labels, figure out your publishing liability, and in a couple of years, you could maybe bring this thing to market. And she's like, but I built it in 24 hours. It's ready to go. So the speed at which technology works simply is going to we're just going to butt up against it. And I've seen companies whose seed rounds were 16, 20 million dollars going into the VR augmented reality space, all of which will be music starving. I mean, they, you know, VR doesn't work without music. And all they want to do is pay writers. And all they want to do is pay labels. But the structure for them to do that is utterly flawed. So what happens is they end up hiring people to come in and actually make it for them and just pay them. Just say, I will pay you to own it completely, or they just get something. And that get something is what we need to worry about. I believe we have approximately, and I, I'm bullish on this, I believe we have approximately a year in which this just won't work anymore for a majority of these companies. And if you think that one point, you know, four or five billion dollars is going into this technology now, the investments, I mean, look at Facebook, look at Google, look at Amazon. These are not companies who are gonna sit there and wait for this. They will punch ahead as fast as they can. So my thinking has always been, what if we can take control of the asset that we offer them? And what if we control how that asset works as an industry? Then we can say to them, these are the rules. And on the licensing side, I mean, AI music has come incredibly far in the last six months. I mean, it's scary how good it's gotten. You can do multiple genres, different tempos. They, you know, these companies would love to use our great music that is unique, but if they have 80% good enough, they get a B minus, that might be good enough for a lot of these folks and they can get away with it for a long time without having to come to us. And to put that into context, if the, a study was recently published that 38% of US jobs will disappear to robotics and automation in the next 15 years. And to Joe's point, I've met four, three or four AI companies, and their sole thing is we will solve all that for you because we're going to have a machine that creates all the music you need, and it's free. Once you, you just pay a license fee to do it. And, and remember, you know, every, every, every technology comes along that looks like magic. You know, it's extraordinary to where you can literally push a button, say, I want this, 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 and this, and music starts playing. 
it will get that good. So we mustn't be under any illusion that like this is happening rapidly. It's not going to happen slowly. There's not going to be a kind of like, oh, look, I think we have a year. I don't know that we have it. I think we've got to <laughs> do what we can. And I'm positive about that, not negative. Merci pour, uh, thank you for those long answers. It's very thorough. Thank you. <laughs> La prochaine question, s'il vous plaît. Bonjour, Jean-François Denis. Hello. Um, asking the basic question, you're talking about assets, and your basic requirements are songwriter, lyricist, composer, and performer with a recorded v version of that. Yep. Uh, what about music that does exist, but is not recorded? Symphonies. Yeah. A symphony that was created yesterday, uh, this week, uh, yeah. another brick in the wall. It's an opera based on the Pink Floyd album. Yeah. That's not recorded, but it does exist. Yeah. It really does exist. The, the, um, the method, so there's two, two answers to that in my head. The first one is, um, what we want to do is partner with the digital streaming providers. And the great part is MediaNet has a massive database of, of the works, as does you know, our other partners. So if you were to need to map a, a, a composition to something that has a recording out there, but you may not have one, you can map it to existing recordings of it. And again, the more entanglements it has, the better it would be to reference that specific work. But the other side of that is, 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 is um, you know, again, we're going to get a lot of stuff wrong. Um, uh, early on, but if the path to getting to the correct thing is, is listed and transparent and everyone can see it, I think we'll be okay. On that written side, the one you're talking about there, it's definitely a trickier, um, a trickier method, um, and I don't have a specific answer for how I would do that in the technology stack that we have, but what I would say is, is that there would be a, uh, a plugin that could be built that would allow for that type of thing to happen. Um, and what I think it would be is you'd create your identity as a composer and you would create your identity in terms of other works and you'd map to that and you would create basically um, uh, uh, empty submissions, if you were, well, like, like a kind of a holding pattern so, so, that, so that that recording, when it's done, would basically be able to, you'd be able to add to the changelog to it. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you could just upload a, a blank MP3 in that yep. instance. I mean, you know, if there's no effective recording, then you just put something, a, you know, a zero byte file and say it's coming soon. I think we could find a better way to do that, but yeah, no, no, I think you're right, yeah. But, no, but the, the, the other way is, you know, our, the reason that that works, it sounds crazy, but the reason that that works is you only really need to worry about it reaching a service once it is in that recorded form. So ideally speaking, you can still use your existing methodology for, for safeguarding it and for holding it, but the .bc file is something that you're meant to commit commerce with. So I don't know that there's much of a market for people buying unrecorded works online. If, if there are, I'm you know, open to fixing that problem too, or someone else should do it. Again, we're not building all of the plugins. We're building the, the layer that allows the plugins to talk. So um, think of that as a business that you could uh, build on top. Using this for other just composition metadata tracking is totally possible. It's just that's not, I think, the application, yeah. the first application you have in mind. There's yep. thousands of applications I think can be used based on this data. Um, it may not be the uh, most straightforward, you know, way to do it. Yeah. Uh, you know. but, and the reason, too, for, the, for, the, for a recording of it is, is we want to map it to what it actually sounds like. And I break it down to its like, simplest form. If I think of uh, uh, the Library of Congress in America or like Smithsonian Folkways and they've got an old Muddy Waters recording, how do I know what that is? Because it says on the label, Muddy Waters, and it's got some information on it. But if you lose that label, how do you know what it actually sounds like? How do you like, connect the dots? So my reason for the recording is the recordings are where things go wrong, nine times out of 10. And so if you've composed something on paper and it gets used over here, over here, over here, you can map to it. That's the point. You can basically say, ah, there it is in Spotify, there it is in YouTube, there it is in SoundCloud, there it is there. And by your own authority within the system, you will map back to whatever it is that you create. And again, this is also the minimum viable data set. So you could add sheet music to it later. You could add you know, the arrangements that you like for this song. You could add all sorts Genres, of additional metadata. Genres, yep. Lyric content, etc. Thank you. Prochaine question? Yes, hello, my name is Guillaume. I'm sorry to bring that question, but what about the quantum computers? Uh, according to the fact that... Quantum? Uh, quantum, sorry. Yeah. 
uh, according to the fact that uh, something that uh, usually takes like 10,000 years uh, to calculate, uh, this will be resolved into a second. Yeah. Um, well, I bring this idea that uh, it can be a threat for the blockchain to be like decalculate. So that would mean that would be able to go back into the blockchain and change all the, the ledger uh, or maybe at least 51% of the ledger. And mm -hmm. this would be a, a huge problem. What, what are your thoughts about that? I certainly have some. You want to go first? <laughs> Why don't you go first? So quant uh, the gentleman's question is referring to quantum computing. And quantum computing basically would be the fastest computing known ever. Um, our music blockchain is the least of my concerns. It's the transportation safety authority. It's the airlines. It's the banks that really need to worry about this. Because quantum computing utterly changes the game for every type of security. Um, if you think that Amazon. Uh, which provides the web services for a bunch of websites, had a slow day, and a whole bunch of websites just did not work. So all of a sudden, none of our images loaded on our homepage because Amazon has a bad day. Quantum computing is, is the threat is, is there, and, I, and I, I, I fully appreciate that we'll get there, but I think that the music side would be the last thing that they would be going for. It's the, it, you know, the FinTech side would be there. That said, there's no reason that you couldn't propose to the existing players of the music ecosystem, we've got a quantum computing blockchain solution available. The, the purpose of this is we're blockchain agnostic. It could be a series of blockchains or it could be the technology can shift. The information within the bundles is what we need to get because that way, you know, it could be a specific like, you know, Intel provides one layer of the blockchain and IBM proposes the other. This is just a technological solution that involves a novel way of getting the works and the format anchored down. But I think that, that, honestly, quantum computing will crack anything. But that said, the first applications will be built that will stop that. So, you know, um, I, I often look at it this way. If, if a performing rights organization is going into the cloud to use cloud computing like Amazon Web Services or Google or IBM, that's like we're the first moon landing, right? And then if we're talking about getting all songs into smart contracts with real-time payments, that's the second Mars mission with humans landing there, right? If we want to talk about quantum computing, I think we're talking about you know, you know, mass colonization on Mars. So there's a way to go here. I know that IBM released a bunch of stuff around the quantum computing stack, but even they've said it's not really true quantum computing yet. So I think we just have to see. But like I said, the music block, blockchain would not be the one I'd be worrying about if we get serious quantum computing. It would be the you know, trillion dollar payments and settlement systems that we got to worry about uh, uh, first. And you know, the fact that we probably will be securing cancer pretty quickly and you know, yeah. fixing the human genome so we live a lot longer and yeah. all the other good things that will come from that. I, 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 I'm I, not a big problem in my mind. I, I, I'd worry about hacking uh, all the driverless trucks and cars. So they, you know what I mean? I think that's what we need to look at. Thank you. I love that analogy with Mars. I think I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna tweet that later. Um, <laughs> we, you know the question? Yeah. You're gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> I have a question when it, it concerns like sample based music, like sample based sorry, music. Please start again. Like, I couldn't hear you. Like you know, like a band like Justice or Daft Punk, they use like pieces of a lot of different songs and they create their own songs. Yep. So if I understand why your system, for example, if we started as a DJ, like creating pieces of a lot of songs, we import them in Logic or Ableton or like any kind of DAO and then we export it, then in this file, we're going to have like the information of the origin of every single like yep. sound. You could even go down to the stems of each individual song if you really wanted to get fancy. Wow. Um, you know, it's really, again, this, the, the way he's describing is the minimum viable. You could also embed inside of embeds, inside of embeds. I mean, there are certainly songs that we have that have samples of samples of samples. I have a song called This Is Why I'm Hot by an artist named Mims. It has 14 publishers just in America. <laughs> it's like 200 <laughs> something worldwide. It will never be used or licensed. Yeah. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Can I use it in my VR game? Definitely. Just, just call these <laughs> 250 people. Just uh, get, try to get the French sub publisher on the phone and uh, you know, ask them about that song that they forgot about. It has, they have 3.2% per, per of. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's going to enable songs like that that are just a, a rights disaster to potentially be a 
possibly used yep. <laughs> once, every once yeah. in a while. So um, I, I designed this with actually DJs and mashups in mind. Um, one of the biggest um, uh, kind of crimes that I saw was that companies like SoundCloud and YouTube built monster businesses on the backs of DJs. And some people would argue that DJs are building monster businesses on the backs of songwriters and artists. Now, so, so, so we, we have an unhealthy swimming upstream going on, right? But here's the thing. The way in which we looked at the stems and musical instruments is the way that DJs look at songs. They just look at them as an instrument, a way of playing something. So in my estimation, what we get to is a DJ goes into this .bc lake of 65 million, 100 million songs, right? And starts to go, I'm going to take that, 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 that. And when they create this new work and register it as a .bc, they said, I've created it. And attribution goes right the way back, as Joe points out, to the drummer who's getting some money from sound exchange or, or from PPL or from the equivalent over here every time that DJ makes money. So I believe that the platforms like SoundCloud and YouTube should pay the DJs, and they should also pay everyone else within that stack if they can identify them all. Because the theory in that graph of claims that I showed you were that the tagging happens. Remember, Joe can go into that 200 person snarl and start to tag them. And once they tag them, it's like, look, someone's trying to commit commerce with you. Just answer the fucking tag. Or after a certain point, again, propose not the law. It's true. There you go. There's also the notion that if you are a certain publisher, you could have a default setting for things that you've ignored. Yep. A default thing setting for certain catalogs. Maybe some catalogs you set as an ignore, and then you would allow no licensing, or a yellow light kind of licensing, amber light maybe up here, yeah. um, where it needs an approval, or a green light where it's, you know, come on down. Um, and you have, can have different catalogs. I know within my catalog, we're a boutique, we're a larger boutique music publisher, but at the downtown side, we really have clients that don't want us to use any licensing for their songs. We have some that want us to license everything, and a lot in between. Um, and some certain songs they never want to use. This certain song is very sacred to them. It will never be licensed, so on and so forth. So these rules will be able to propagate and go up and down across samples and so on and so forth. Yeah, and, and, but just so you know, like, like, and again, I've, I've invested in companies that are trying to solve this problem too. I believe that, that um, the works created in mashups and remixes are um, just as valid, if not more so, in certain instances because they are creating something brand new. We don't look at it that way, but that's because we're 150 years old. And my daughter, who's five, will not understand that concept. If we get it right, the platform's job is to pay everybody. If that's how that platform makes money, if that's how they pay their stuff, if that's how they pay for everything going on, then they should pay everybody involved. And we can facilitate that transaction trail. Um, and again, this won't be easy, but but. Not, you know, nothing great is easy. We've got we to we do this. So, yeah, my instinct is, is that once people see the sheer amount of money that can be made by being able to, to work with these files in this really creative way, I think everyone's going to open up that, that, um, that, that tap of, of money and, and uh, income that will come with it. Yeah, so basically, you have to get people to trust the system where trust is no longer needed. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but, but, and that's also, but that was the initial intent. So, so, so um, a woman, man, or group of people named Satoshi Nakamoto gave away the first blockchain software on the internet basically eight years ago and wrote a white paper that suggested this is who it is. Now, it's arguable as to who this person or people are, but what was interesting was is they just wanted to solve a problem. If I send Joe a piece of a Bitcoin, um, how, do, how does he not double spend that Bitcoin, right? How does he not, you know, how, how can you, how can you di differentiate one asset from another? In the music industry, like I explained before, once I create an export from a workstation into a file, Joe can co copy everything about it, but worse, can alter it all. So what Satoshi, whoever they are, decided to do is create something that you couldn't alter. And it was very, very clever. And whoever they are, they have a million Bitcoins on the blockchain um, available to them to, to spend, which is basically today $100 million. They also have a tax liability over eight years for $100 million, which is another matter. And they couldn't withdraw them because it would tank it. So it's a, there's a huge amount in the technology. But the key is, is to facilitate trust where, where a lack of trust exists. 
And I can think of no better application in the music industry <laughs> to do that. Yeah. I think there was one last question. Est-ce qu'il y avait une dernière question derrière le micro? I, I already asked one, but if, if I may, okay. I'll ask another one. Um, to me, the first block or the first brick of, of your concept seems to be some sort of trusted uh, legal deposit. It sounds to me like a legal deposit at, at Power 10. I was wondering, to some extent, if you had had any discussions with the Copyright Office or, or with the, uh, the Library of Congress, how, how much do these guys could be interested in supporting and participating in this project? The Library of Congress is very aware of what blockchain is. Um, most of the government at, you know, I'd say mid to high level does understand what this technology means for their work. Um, the current setup within the Library of Congress is quite precarious from an a IT perspective, and I say that derogatorily. <laughs> um, it is a challenge. It was a noted challenge by the former um, Registrar of Copyrights uh, and the former, uh, you know, LOC kind of didn't really care. Um, there is a kind of schism between the the internal LOC and why it, why is the Copyright Office in the LOC? So I, I, from a technological perspective, them adopting new technologies is a very, very painful and slow process, as we've seen in America with the current notice of intent issues, although they have made great, great leaps and bounds in recent months. Um, in general, I think they are optimistic but hesitate to adopt any certain standard and really want the community to figure that out before they go headlong. Um, although they may, you know, who knows if, if the administration decides this is a priority, they may invest in it. Uh, we've seen some interesting things on that front technologically. I just don't know if this is the biggest issue they have on their plate when you have a uh, pretty archaic set of other technological institutions within the American government. So, and I'll speak from the, um, uh, where if you look at the, the concentric ring architecture, each ring is a cloud, so each plugin is a cloud bridge, essentially. So you're basically going to say, my data warehouse here is going to speak into the system. And my goal, and what I would love to see happen, is that every copyright office all over the world runs a node of this system. And so once the song reaches a certain threshold of information, you can say, I want to copyright it. And it will copyright it, boom, one click. And I know how hard that is to get to. You know, maybe you and I go to Mar-a-Lago and we'll have a chat with the, with, the, with the orange man himself and see what we can do. But like, um, but because I was speaking actually with an amazing French lawyer friend of mine um, yesterday and she was saying that like, you know, in America, the definition is to fix in a tangible form. And in, uh, in France, for example, it is to, uh, I think, when it's realized, when the work is realized is the definition. And what occurred to me was, what is, ta what is a tangible form today? What does that actually mean if you are, you know, and the answer is not the wave file, which has information that can be taken out of it in any which way, shape, or form. What if tangible form is this work has been created for people of authority in the song have created persistent information about it, and any changes will always go back. And it's confirmed across 2,700 nodes of the blockchain. That's tangible, because oh. you can't remove it. So what you're doing is, is even if the end result changes, it's still, it's more tangible, because you've got the audit trail. And I think that an amazing use case for the copyright offices around the world would be to sit there and hold a record of the audit trail on their own private system, that also would express back to the, to the blockchain itself. One of the other big things about this is, is as you build systems like this, you can build a button that be, you know, does all those tests, whatever the local test is, whatever they need in terms of their legal framework, you can make it so you press this button and it does whatever magic thing that is, if it's printing a CD or you know, sending it to this office or whatever it needs to be. Um, I don't necessarily think the laws will catch up fast enough for the for the technology. That said, I mean the mission of these offices is to preserve the Creative Commons and such, and, and um, I don't see why they wouldn't, and you know, yeah. love to make hay of this. And the interesting thing too is, is I always looked at this when I when the when the dot blockchain thing popped into my head, I saw the digital library of Alexandria 
and you can't remove it unless you kill all systems. And so what's interesting about it is, is if, if every copyright office were to run a node, because it's not cheap to run a node, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, and small publishers will share nodes with larger publishers, and, you know, publishing organizations can run nodes and trade organizations, so there's a, a huge play for every, oh, I try to look at every, every player in the industry who could do it, because all of that work together creates a digital library of Alexandria. And what you have there is, is because ideally speaking, if you're listening to a song and you really like it and you go, hey, I want to use that for this, I just want a button in Spotify or, or, or say, Alexa, who wrote this song? And it just says, this is the person that wrote it, you know, on and on. Send them an email. <laughs> you know, that, that sounds crazy, but that's exactly how it should be. If I go to a library, it shows me that there's a map. I can go and say, I'm looking for this book. Do you have it? No, but I can call this other library that does. That happening at speed and scale is where we'll get to. And I think it will be faster than we think. But to me, again, I, I just think of it. Today, we cannot, I would argue this, and I've argued it with lawyers and I've lost, but that's another matter. But I, I would argue that we do not have the facility to fix any of our works in a tangible form. Because, if, because it's only in relation to how you listen to that. The record sitting in the Library of Congress with Muddy Waters' name on it is only as good as that piece of paper on top. Because if I remove that piece of paper and I put that work out there, how would you ever identify it? Audio fingerprinting, which one's the correct one? Who wrote the song? I don't know. It's, it's endless. But if you create a true digital first version with a unique ID created by the blockchain, every single amendment from that moment on is its power. And so what you'd have to do is a huge amount of, of fixing and appending to change the, the, the total bulk history of that work. And you could do it, legally speaking, you could get all the parties into a courtroom and argue it, but I believe we will get to a stage whereby when you, uh, the publishers and labels in the room, when you have disputes and you resolve them in a court, let's say, the judge will say you have until this time to amend the blockchain with this information. And you guys, and, and the workflow will, will facilitate, dissolve, dis, resolve dispute, 75, 25, whatever it is, uh, 75, 25, 75, 25, all three agree, boom, there it is. So that workflow will need to be built, but what better time to start with a day zero than with a, with a, with a blockchain whereby it's not going to be like, hey, Amazon's down so we can't access anything today. It, it just won't work that way, so, you know. It's, it's internet reliant, there is that, but you know, I, I feel good about the internet. I feel those are great closing words. Est-ce qu'il y a une autre question avant qu'on termine cette uh, conférence? Thank you so much. So, Benji Rogers and John Conyers Joe. III. Joe, Joe, Joe Conyers III. Merci beaucoup. Right. Thank you.